All right, good evening, everybody. It's nice to see everybody back here again. And uh, we'll have Ivan and Emily in here just a moment, give a formal introduction to uh, Bryce Andrews. But I'm really, really delighted uh, to have Bryce in our, in our speaking series tonight here, um, speaking about living with predators in the West. I've known Bryce for about 15 years now. He's, he started in the graduate program in environmental studies here just about the same time I started as a professor here. In fact, it's in the very first ethics and restoration class that uh, I taught. And, uh, and we share a lot of uh, a love of different landscapes, places around here as well. So it's really, really uh, delightful to have him here. Um, I will load up his PowerPoint here in just a moment. And we have Ivan and Emily who are gonna go ahead and do the introduction. So feel free to go ahead and start that. Good evening, everyone. Today we have the honor of hosting Bryce Andrews as our as our speaker tonight. Um, Bryce Andrews was born in Seattle and grew up in Seattle, but then he moved a little bit farther east near Yellowstone to work on a ranch. And then he's really passionate about carnivore management and conservation. And he currently lives in Montana and works for a nonprofit that helps deal with conflicts between people and carnivores. And he's also written several books on this topic too. Uh, Bryce is the author of multiple award-winning books regarding carnivore human conflict in Montana, including the fall 2020 Grizz Read, Down from the Mountain. Uh, several of you may have read it. It's the story about, a grizz, about grizzly bear human conflict in the Flathead Valley and uh, the tragedy that ultimately ensues. Uh, he's here today to talk to us about uh, carnivore human conflict. So. Well, thanks very much here. And Bryce, I'm going to turn this over to you. And let's see, um, you should be able to just advance it on the arrows down here, but I'm right here if you need me. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dan. Um, thank you, Emily and Ivan, um, and all of you for having me in tonight. Can everybody hear me okay out there? Okay. Um, so this is a little bit of a different thing for me. I haven't, you know, been in a room with this many people in quite some time. And it's both terrifying and wonderful to like see real human faces. Um, as Emily and Ivan spoke about a little bit, I have a life of a couple of different pieces. So I came here, I grew up in a city, I grew up far away from the work that I do now and the place where I now live. But I came here uh, because I wanted to work on ranches and specifically I wanted to work on ranches that were in some of the wilder and, and more remote corners of the state. And, and I did that. I, I was a ranch hand, I was a ranch manager. Um, and now I have one of those strange, um, you know, maybe Kittredge, as in his piece here, would put it as sort of a double bind kind of a life in which I, uh, my wife and I have uh, a farm where we raise both a farm and a ranch where we raise cattle and we're starting a UPIC uh, berry growing operation. And I also uh, work, as you see on this uh, PowerPoint, as the field director for a nonprofit group called People and Carnivores. And one of the things that that means, and I also write. So those are the, sort of the three corners of my life. And this presentation is going to kind of move between them. Um, one of the interesting things about straddling that divide between um, the world of agriculture and the world of conservation, and specifically large carnivore conservation and animal agriculture, is that very rarely am I presented with a situation where there seems to be a clear solution or a clear position to take. There's a lot of, I guess, ambiguity in, in, in my life and, and also a lot of complexity that I think is worth sharing in a venue like this. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to start with a presentation that's largely drawn from my work with people in carnivores. And we're going to talk about uh, the large carnivore picture in Montana and across the West, but mostly in Montana. Um, we're going to talk about the state of things, the history, how we got to where we are, and, and kind of where we're going. Um, okay, they can't see the PowerPoint, so keep talking. Okay. Oh, yeah, we'll share the screen. So we're going to begin with that. Um, and then from there, uh, I'm going to take us in a little bit different direction and talk, um, talk more personally about some of the things that happen to us, the ways that sharing a landscape with carnivores can change us, and our experience 
of this place that uh, we call home. So that is my hope for the evening. Um, and I also hope we can see things <laughs> on the screen, because that's ideal. I will say, too, that it has been like really a pleasure to be involved with the university this whole year, um, both through the Grizz Reads thing and also I'm teaching a, a writing workshop um, in environmental studies in the grad program. So it looks like hopefully we're sharing now and everybody can see. So the group that I work for is called People and Carnivores, very small group. It's based in Bozeman, Montana. I'm our field director. Uh, I work from home uh, on Jillian and, uh, Jillian and I's farm uh, up near Arlie. Lee. But our mission, as you can see here, is to reconnect and restore carnivore populations in the Northern Rockies by working with the region's people to prevent human carnivore conflicts. So that can mean a lot of things and we'll get into more precisely what it does mean. But one of the things that I wanna share is that our job here is to essentially move from the mindset of the past to a new mindset, a new way of thinking about sharing the landscape with these complex and difficult animals. Has anybody in the room seen this picture before, the Charlie Russell picture? It's kind of an iconic photograph in which you know, a cowboy is, is throwing a lasso around the, around the neck of a wolf, and you can pretty much imagine that things will not end well for that creature. Um, on the other hand, we have cattle grazing behind one of the conflict reduction tools that we use a lot is fladry. It's a, an electrified line of flagging. So I like to start with these two pictures because they show us something about the myths and stories and mindsets that we've been living with, and also something about where we wanna go. So I think I'd like to start here by taking us through what I mean when I say a large carnivore. Um, this is pretty straightforward, but we're talking about the grizzly. This, these are the fundamental species that people and carnivores works with and on behalf of, and the animals that make up my working life. So you've got grizzlies, which are our largest American predator, evolved in treeless biomes, which uh, actually causes them to be slightly more aggressive than black bears when encountered, um, just because they didn't evolve with a mechanism to escape readily up a tree from conflict. Um, we have got the black bear. What's that? Oh, is it still not working? Okay. You know, I could, as, as Dan's working on this slide, I could go on talking a little bit about these animals because we can do that without a visual aid too. So important thing to know about the grizzly bears, um, all of them uh, are protected currently. Um, there are about 700 grizzlies in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, about 900 to 1,000 in the Northern Continental Divide ecosystem, 60 in the Cabinet Yak, 60 in the Selkirks, and there's talk of reintroduction in the Cascades. And down here in the Bitterroot, which is an immense and amazing swath of grizzly habitat, uh, there are no or vanishingly few documented grizzlies. We're just starting to see the first animals moving down from the NCDE into the Bitterroot. Um, up in Alaska, there remain about 25,000 grizzlies. Um, we are the largest cause of grizzly mortality, uh, human beings are. And in the last two years, we've had two record years of grizzly deaths uh, by human mortality in the NCDE. The black bear, can, do you think people can see now? Dan, do you think, are we on track or no? I'll just keep, I'll keep going with the animals. Um, so the black bear, they're about an estimated 400,000 in the US. And the reason I bring these two things up is just, you know, we focus a lot of our work on grizzly conflicts because there are relatively few of them. Um, but black bear conflicts actually make up 
the majority of low level conflict throughout the state. There are more black bears uh, and more conflicts, but we do tend to focus on the grizzly work a little bit. Um, we also, of course, have the other two species. We've got uh, the gray wolf. Um, we've got about uh, 800 in Montana documented, uh, 2,200 in the Rocky Mountain, Mountains in total. Um, and then we have some smaller populations in Washington and Oregon, a single pack in California, and about 11,000 in Alaska. Um, conflicts um, in Montana. Conflicts have been declining overall since 2010 with an average of about 50 confirmed livestock kills each year for the past five years. So wolves and livestock are often a source of conflict, whereas bear conflicts are very different. Um, I'll just finish by talking a little bit about the mountain lion here. Um, they, mountain lions are an interesting case because they're not protected. Um, they've been subject to hunting you know, throughout recent history, um, and yet they do quite well. There's a, a strong mountain, pop, mountain lion population, um, estimated to be about 30,000 in the US, and there are uh, a number of fatal, or a lot of, there are a lot of lion mortalities based on road conflict, based on livestock conflict, and then there are also a number of human fatalities due to lion attacks. So where we are, so those are our major pieces. Good to go? Okay, all right. Let's see. So let's see, let's go back here. We've kind of moved through this stuff a little bit. What I really wanted to, to share here is that Montana is, is unique in that we have thriving populations in at least some places of all of the large carnivore species um, that, uh, that are native to this part of North America. Um, I wanna talk now a little bit about our relationship with these animals and why they fascinate us. And I want you to sort of do a little bit of a thought exercise here and think your way back into time and think about the way people used to travel, live, and eat. And if you think about that, you know, in, in the very distant past, in the Pleistocene uh, among traditional um, and indigenous societies, you've got a lot of instances of small groups traveling and hunting through the landscape. And that bears a striking resemblance to the behavior of some of these carnivores, particularly pack hunting carnivores like the wolf. So I think what I wanna bring out here is that when we think about carnivores, we're talking about animals that have in some ways similar life ways and similar patterns to our own species. I'm gonna quote Barry Lopez here. Has, if anybody, you know, if you haven't seen uh, Of Wolves and Men, this is a really interesting book. I would recommend reading the whole thing but I'm just gonna quote a couple of paragraphs of Lopez uh, talking about uh, the Nanamute, um, which are uh, an, Eskimo, an Eskimo tribe and their relationship and appreciation for the wolf. So a couple paragraphs here. The Nanamute are a semi-nomadic hunting society as are most of the Indian people I will consider in this section who lead lives similar to wolves. They eat almost the same foods, caribou, some sheep and moose, berries, not much vegetable matter. The harsh environment requires of them both the same stamina, alertness, cooperativeness, self-assurance, and possibly sense of humor to survive. They often hunt caribou in the same way, anticipating caribou movement patterns and waiting at likely spots to ambush them. Hunting in this country is hard and Eskimos respect a good hunter. In all the time he spent with them, uh, Stevenson, who's a researcher, Never heard, never heard Nunamute say anything degrading or contemptuous about a wolf. They admire his skill as a hunter because they know how hard it is to secure game. In the collective years of tribal memory, there are very few stories about wolves that starve to death. The Nunamute, on the other hand, have starved to death. Some of them alive today have gone for a month or more on only scraps of dried meat, pieces of caribou hide and water. It is neither a mystery nor surprising to anyone but a white man who no longer hunts for his food that the Nunamute admire the wolf and emulate his ways. In the land they share, hunting among the same caribou herds, hunting as the wolf does, has proved to be the most reliable way to put meat in your belly. I share that because I want to contrast it 
that relationship of mutual respect, of learning, of admiration, um, with the history that comes later. Because certainly the description that, that he gave of tribal hunters and their relationship with the wolf does not fit um, a, a lot of folks who are making their living from the land in the West today. So something happens when people transition from hunter-gatherer societies to an agricultural uh, way of making a living. There's an introduction, is the beginning of this notion of control. And it's a really, it's, it's intuitive if you think about it. You know, if you begin to depend on the maturation of like this sheep, right? The sheep in this photograph. If the survival or death of that sheep guarantees your sustenance through the winter, then you are placed into a relationship of antagonism with anything that might eat that sheep that's not you. So from this shift, from surviving from the landscape as it was to modifying the landscape to grow our own crops, our own uh, domestic herds, we end up with, the, I think, the beginnings of this systematized or culture-wide conflict with large carnivores. Um, and also from this moment um, springs, into this, it, it springs into being this idea of a dualism between the, culture, the cultivated world and the wilderness, that which we control and that which we do not. And there was this concept um, early in some of these bestiaries, which were these... Um, sort of like books or compilations of all like the extant beasts, beasts in the world. So it'd be like lists of both <laughs> made up and actual creatures that various scholars of the time would keep. There was this concept of sweet and stenchy beasts. So like a beast was either going to be a sweet beast like a lamb or a stenchy beast like a wolf. And whether it fell on one side or the other of that divide um, determined how the people would treat that animal. So... <clears throat> The American West, I would posit, is both an extension of that mindset, a mindset an agricultural mindset, and one in which the ideas of control uh, and ownership are paramount. It's an extension of that, but it's also a special case. Because in the American West, you had a really, <laughs> a really large body of technologically well-supplied people um, colliding with an enormous ecological system. And, and that's something that, you know, could have gone a lot of different ways, but what we ended up with is a culture um, out here that is committed to domesticating and civilizing what is perceived as a wilderness. That's, it, to a great extent, what um, Kittredge is talking about in that essay. Um, in the American West, we saw extensive use of poisons. Uh, we saw uses of disease like sarcoptic mange against large carnivores. Um, we saw essentially a special status being granted to livestock um, and a special, special privileges extended to farmers and ranchers wherein the government would fund and hire trappers and pursue a very organized, very widespread uh, program of destruction of large carnivores. So this is a situation where you have modern weapons being used in a very old conflict. Um, what are the results? So if you look at this, um, hopefully this graphic will work. Um, here we have, ooh, wait, hold on. Okay, I think, I think I might've gotten my slides flip-flopped, but so this is a distribution map, as you can see, um, of the grizzly bear and black bear, their distribution today. If I advance, oh, come on. Well, that's frustrating. <laughs> well, I had a great graphic here for you guys um, that was <laughs> supposed to show the distribution today and historically, but I can tell you what it would look like. So the grizzly bear had a range that extended all the way down into Northern Mexico, and it ran east all the way out to the Great Plains. Um, oh, I guess actually you guys can see that. You can see the green in there. Okay, perfect, 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 okay. All right, I'm having a little technological moment, but this does make sense. So yeah, what you can see here in green, um, which I can see too, uh, is, yeah, that is the historic distribution of the grizzly bear and the black bear. And the orange is their current range. Um, the same 
you can show this for the mountain lion and the gray wolf. And what you see here is this immense restriction of the places where these animals are able to survive. Uh, and that has everything to do with human manip manipulation of the landscape and the ways that we have changed this place. Um, when, I, when I talk about the, um, when I talk about the current situation in the American West, it's important to understand that we've been through a very unnatural period in history that we call uh, often in conflict reduction work, the, the carnivore gap. So because of all these programs of extermination, because of the artificial depression of the numbers of large carnivores and the restriction in their ranges, we've ended up with this situation where for you know, the better part of a century, you had no carnivores in a lot of the places where people were making their living agriculturally or so few that they didn't really figure into things. Um, what we're seeing right now is an interesting reversal of that situation where you know, enough people within, within our culture have looked at this, have been critical of it, um, and have begun to take actions such as protection under the Endangered Species Act, such as local land use um, ordinances and easements that protect the uh, places that these animals need, that we're actually beginning to see recovery. So that's a wonderful and a positive thing, but what comes with recovery um, are more animals and more conflicts. And that creates a really um, interesting world to work in for someone like me. So what we see in today's social landscape, um, generally speaking, are people living with the expectations they developed in a landscape without carnivores. So when those expectations collide with the realities on the ground, Oftentimes people feel blindsided um, and feel as if, uh, feel you know, poorly done by. You also have things like inherited bias. You've got families that have built family cultures out of, out of this relationship of conflict with large carnivores. Um, and you also have economic pressures. And this is a really important thing to understand. Um, and this is where this discussion, which may seem really insular and particular to large carnivores, really kind of sticks its tendrils out into the rest of our society because a lot of the people that I'm describing here, people who are making their living from the land, uh, like ranchers and farmers, they are living on the finest of economic margins. And that has to do with the construction and injustices uh, inherent in our food system as, as it's set up today. Um, there are also, because there has been a long carnivore gap, because um, there's all of these entrenched cultures surrounding carnivores and, and being in conflict with them, a number of special interest groups have come to actually exercise a fairly large voices. Those could be cattlemen's associations or wood, wool growers associations, but essentially confederations of people who have a vested interest in the, in the pure amount of you know, animal, animal product uh, produced from an acre which is a really different thing from an interest in like, how are the families doing on the land? And that's an important, um, that's an important distinction to recognize. Uh, so carnivore conflicts on the landscape. Um, it's important to understand that they, they vary a lot. They vary by species, they change with the landscape, um, but carnivore conflicts occur everywhere we share the landscape with these animals. And they likely always will. This is what, what our work about is about at People and Carnivores is basically like trying to increase the odds for good coexistence, trying to reduce the odds of conflict that can hurt somebody or end the life of one of these animals. Um, I want to kind of, yeah. Oh, let's see. In the upper right. Yeah, so actually what's going on here in the upper right, um, that is a, that's a cornfield. That's a cornfield up in the Mission Valley. And what you can see in there is an area probably about the size of this classroom um, that grizzly bears have knocked down. Um, so those are, yeah, those are flattened corn stalks. And I think that, and that's, you know, one of the things that I think is really interesting is that you end up with a lot of these conflicts in places where you wouldn't expect them. Um, you know, and that's because these animals have gotten so good at sharing the landscape with us and utilizing the food sources that we have put in place of a lot of uh, the, the natural ones. 
So we have a whole suite of agricultural conflicts um, that people in carnivores works on. Um, that could be things like carcass disposal for ranches. It could be putting up fences around crop attractants. It could be helping landowners get livestock guardian dogs uh, to work on wolf and bear conflict. Or it could be protecting animals with electrified perimeters uh, like the flagging that you see down below. We also work in the backcountry. Um, that's a whole other aspect of this stuff. Um, we put up, I think we put up something like 250 bear food storage structures across the state. So those are mostly bear poles like you can see in the, the middle photograph. Um, we work to educate people um, in the proper use and carrying of bear spray. And then we also do uh, a loaner program where people can get the um, sort of food storage stuff that they need to go out into the backcountry. Um, a lot of work on residential attractants. Um, the three photos you can see here, these are bear safe bins. It seems like we can never get enough of these out into the world. Um, they've, they have saved a lot of bears lives. Um, that's, we work on, you know, this, the, middle, the middle picture is of a berry patch um, belonging to a member of the Salish Kootenai tribe. It's right up against the Mission Mountains um, and it keeps her berry patch uh, safe and bears safe as well. And we use all kinds of cool little gadgets like this. Um, uh, that's, this is called a critter getter, this thing that you can see on the left. And it's the most terrible piercing little siren attached to a motion detector. And it's actually really effective as a temporary deterrent for bears. Um, so we do all these like small projects, but what it all adds up to are some very large things on the landscape. So one of the primary goals in the, the mission statement that I read to you at the beginning has to do with reconnecting populations and restoring uh, bears to habitat where they vanished. And so connectivity is this incredibly important thing. And we are sitting here in Missoula in an essential spot um, as regards grizzly bear populations and habitat. It's true for all large carnivores, but I think grizzlies are a really great lens to look at this through because this area is so important to them. Um, so if you go north from here, you're in the Northern Continental Divide ecosystem. You're in a place that has a flourishing, thriving grizzly population that is growing. It's actually a source population. So bears are moving outward from there to other places. If you look to the west and the south, um, you see the Selway Bitterroot Wilderness and beyond that, the Frank Church River of No Return Wilderness. This is the largest roadless area remaining in the lower 48. And it is perhaps the best and largest intact habitat for grizzly bears you know, that, that we possess in this area. And we are just now beginning to see bears make that trip from the NCDE and possibly even beginning to see them from the Yellowstone population into this area where they could thrive. And that's an incredibly important thing. And it's all of these little like kind of anno annoying little projects like fencing this field or getting these people livestock guardian dogs. All of that stuff adds up to improving the odds for these bears as they travel across the landscape and making it possible for them to survive that crossing, find another bear, reproduce and continue this whole cycle. So connectivity is of incredible importance. Um, I just wanted to share, just kind of to give sort of a personal touch to this, I wanted to share a couple of the projects that we do, um, just because I think it's kind of interesting to look at how do you actually put, you know, like put this stuff into practice. Um, this is the, the slide that's up right now is about the Hansen Ranch, um, which is a, a ranch up in the Flathead Valley where they had a multi-year history of depredation. They were losing multiple calves every single year to wolves. Multiple wolves had been killed because of this. So you had this kind of chronic back and forth. Um, what we did there is we installed an electrified perimeter around their calving yacht, lot. Um, and the first year, it was, it was flagry. So it's a single strand of electrified wire with flags hanging from it. You saw that picture at the beginning. Um, we put that up and whenever we put that up, every rancher in the world's like, that ain't gonna work. You know, there's like this moment where they look at you and they look at this like little strand hanging out there and they say, that is ridiculous. And, then, and you have to look back at them and say like, just give it a chance. And so we did that, we put it up. There were no depredations. And I went to John and Kate Hansen at the end of it. And they said the other thing that ranchers always say, which is like, luck, that was luck. 
and and so I said, okay, all right. Do you want do you want to do it next next year? And they said the third thing they always say, which is, yeah, let's do it again because we didn't lose any this year. So I came back the next year, but I came back with trail cameras, and we put those trail cameras up at every corner of that flagery. And what we saw, and we had them check the trail cameras, which was crucial. What they saw was that wolves were running the full perimeter of that electrified barrier. The same wolf would appear on multiple cameras in multiple places, and that, and that they never had a wolf cross. And so we did this for, I think, three years, maybe even four years with them. And we had zero losses since the beginning of that. Now, I'm not saying that any uh, one tool will work that well all the time, or even that that tool would work so well for someone else. But occasionally you see something like that where you've had years of loss and you've had years of blood on both sides of the ledger. And then you can put a tool into place and it just feels great. <laughs> Cause like it's, you realize, you know, those people will be more likely to make their own living, to keep making their living, keep the land open and the wolves will continue to be able to move through there. Um, let's see. Uh, just a word about the bear poles, just because it's a really fun part of what we do. Um, it's actually, I, I think it's become my favorite part of the job because basically it's, you know, I get this assignment to like go, go forth into some pretty spot, um, you know, with a, you know, another coworker uh, and use these huge block and tackle things to raise these poles into place. Um, but one of the cool things to know about this is that um, this is not only just for backpackers, this is also something that's being used more and more by hunters in the backcountry, because hunter conflict with bears is a really, it's really common, um, happens every year. Almost every year, it seems like somebody gets attacked and almost every year, it seems like one or two grizzly bears get shot by hunters. And something like this, where you can have in a remote area, a way to get that bear attractant, the carcass, so far off the ground that the bears can't get to it, uh, you're just training them into better behavior and, and training hunters into better behavior too. Livestock guardian dogs. This is a really cool thing that we've been doing more and more. So across, you know, much of the rest of the world, guardian dogs are used with herds. The only reason we've gotten out of the habit of using them here um, in, to a large extent is because of that carnivore gap that I was talking about. And one of the things that, that I really like doing as part of my job is we cost share with people and we walk them through all the steps of getting livestock guardian dogs and getting them out with their animals. And that's a really fun thing to do because those dogs have been bred, you know, they've been bred for, for hundreds of thousands of years toward being incredibly vigilant and doing exactly this thing. And it's just such a joy when you see those animals out on the land beginning to work and you start to see people in some ways relaxing like relaxing in a way that they haven't done in years. Cause this is the thing I can tell you as a rancher, as somebody who has worked for other people as a ranch hand, a ranch manager, and who has my own cattle. If, if I knew right now that we had a wolf pack that was right down by our cows, I would not be able to relax standing here because I would, and I, I wouldn't even be coherent because I would have spent the last nine, 10 nights staying up all night, either worrying or being out there trying to avoid a problem. So when you can put a tool into place that gives farmers and ranchers an, an ally in this situation, an animal that will work on their behalf, it's a really neat thing. Um, now, I'm just going to close here a little bit with, for this section, I'm gonna close by, by just talking a little bit about why this stuff matters. I talked about connectivity um, and that's important. You know, it's this, these kind of projects matter because they help more bears, more wolves, more lions get safely from the places where they're currently thriving to the places we wanna see them in the future. They're also, it's also important because it helps people practicing agriculture stay on the land. And that's something that I really don't wanna lose in this shuffle. The idea is not, for me anyway, to rewild the entire state of Montana such that, you know, people can't live here anymore. This is. This is about figuring out ways of practicing agriculture and ways of living from the landscape so that it's permeable to wildlife and also sustainable for people to raise food in this place. Um, it's also important because it reduces human risk. You know, a lot of these, particularly the less glamorous things like doing the bear proof trash cans, like food storage structures, all of that, 
decreases the likelihood of somebody basically getting killed by a large carnivore. Um, and it reduces the likelihood of us killing them too. Um, and I think the, the last thing is that it, it accelerates cultural change. It creates the space to have a dialogue that lets us think differently about our relationship to these animals and this place. So with that in mind, I want to kind of transition out of my like, like project manager role. And I wanna talk a little bit um, more specifically about grizzlies. Um, I wanna do this because I've written about them, I think about them a lot, and I share my, my farm with them. Um, Jillian and I have actually had a, a grizzly bear uh, day bedding like 50 yards from the corner of our house, which is an incredible thing. And we never would have known about it if there hadn't been uh, you know, a, a radio caller or a GPS caller to let us know that because bears are that good at sharing the landscape with us. So, yeah. I, I am, yeah. I'm gonna do the stop share so they can see you. Okay, great. Okay, here, here I am, here's my masked chin for all of you who are out there in the world. Um, all right. For years after I came to Montana, I worked in large, on large ranches in the mountains adjacent to Yellowstone Park. In autumn, it was often my lot to ride out before first light in search of stray cattle and trespassing hunters. The sights, sounds, and feelings of that task have not left me. I remember what can be heard once the eyes give up on seeing, the cold that prevails before the slow brightening, and how much a horse knows about the shrouded world. But describing the brittleness of frosted grass, the way my lungs ached and vibrated in tune to the empty sky, or how easy it was to lose faith in the sun's coming, falls short of describing that hour and the work. To my way of thinking, there are two kinds of mountains, those that still contain grizzlies and those that have lost them. There are large carnivores all over the Northwest and some of them are fearsome enough. Anyone who has seen a pack of wolves run an elk to exhaustion or witnessed the smooth, dangerous approach of a mountain lion will agree. A black bear too is a creature worth respecting, but nothing else is like a grizzly. This seemed particularly true to me when I was horseback in the hours before morning. The threat of bears loomed large on my pre-dawn rides because predators love and own the crepuscular hours. As I went out from the barn with the horse jigging and only halfway sold on the idea of walking alone, darkness would press in from all sides. On one ranch where I worked and grizzlies were particularly numerous, the land was shaped like an upturned hand with timbered fingers running down from the peaks to the valley floor. Making my rounds on that place meant crossing many creeks and there were always noises in the brush. Stirrings pricked the horse's ears and set his muscles tightening. That tautness passed up through my legs, uniting us. As if the stream of time had clotted, everything slowed while we strained to discover what the hidden creature was. We bent our attention to sounds, dim shapes and hints on the wind. The horse knew more than I did and when relief entered his body, it washed like a tide over me. On such mornings, I came to understand how the proximity of grizzlies changes a person. I tasted fear, which burns the tongue's tip like copper, and I felt my body not. I also felt a particular kind of wonder and awe that I had never known before. I tell you all this because I wanna make clear that in seeking to return grizzlies to places where we have exterminated, we are undertaking worthwhile, necessary, and serious work. Bringing back the bears will enrich our lives. It will also complicate them. Still, we should do it. We should work to bring back grizzlies for ecological reasons, because they are an essential part of a complex whole, necessary for the proper functioning of this ecosystem 
as pistons are necessary to an engine. And we should do it for historical and ethical reasons too. They belong here. They deserve to thrive in this place at least as much and perhaps more than we do. And then there's this. I want the bears to return because of how sharing the mountains and valleys with them will change each and every one of us. There is something about grizzlies that fascinates and pulls at everyone who encounters them. Half of it is their odd mix of bulk and grace. A healthy bear is a walking paradox, a heavy, seemingly ungainly creature that can turn swift and lithe in a moment. I have seen a boar grizzly running faster than a sprinting horse can, stretching out and loping across an open meadow. Coming to a stand of brush, that bear stopped short. Losing all evidence of strength and speed, he went lumpish and shambled from sight. The change was as complete and as unlikely as water flashing into steam, and I never forgot it. Then there are the eyes, which are not unlike ours in shape and size and distance from each other. A bear's eyes, small in their wide heads, seem made for looking back, for focusing on and assessing us. When grizzlies are not afraid or raging, there is something tranquil, sympathetic, even shy about their eyes. When a human meets a bear, their gazes join like halves of a split stone. A charged arc is struck between two creatures and the rest of the world disappears in that glare. The fire is treacherous and tends toward destruction. It also contains a measure of recognition. Nobody can say what a grizzly makes of that moment, but I know what it means to me. Encountering grizzlies, an experience as consuming as falling, has given me a better grasp of what I am and how I fit into an older world. I want to share the mountains with grizzlies because they remind us that human beings once lived in a community exceeding our own species. When I'm alone and I encounter a grizzly, I am always humbled by its power. When the bear does not eat me, I'm left feeling grateful. These emotions, humility, gratitude, even fear, these are good things, very good things for a human being to feel. The piece that I gave you by William Kittredge, it's about the way that human beings look at the land and they look at wild animals. It centers pretty obviously given the title on questions of ownership and what that word means in respect to land and animals. It's about which creatures have the right to live where and who has the right to change the landscape and how much of the ecological world can be changed, can be messed with before it comes apart. Think about what his grandfather says about the magpies. They're mine, he says, and he means everything. That man wanted to own things. He wanted to possess and control the land completely. That has been our collective goal for too long in the West. And that intent has changed this beautiful place. And it has also changed the people living here and not for the better. That has to change. What I'm telling you now is that we need to stop thinking about owning things and start learning how to share. The last 200 years were bad. A friend of mine who is a Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribal member told me while well, we were working together to put a bear fence around the berry patch at her house. In fact, you guys just saw the berry patch. A fence meant to keep her plants and grizzlies separate and safe. The last 200 years were bad, she said. It's up to us to make sure the next 200 are better. She meant that statement broadly, and she was right, both about the past and our responsibility to the future. But she also captured the way things stand for grizzlies and other wild creatures. The last 200 years have taken as a whole, and in spite of a modest recovery in the past two decades, been disastrous for bears. And we find ourselves now at an entirely decisive moment. Here is the hard truth that I bring you tonight. Even in wild places like the Mission Valley, we are close to the point where there are too many houses and too many risks, too many unprotected garbage cans and cornfields and chickens for grizzlies to thrive. We have already reached the point where humans mostly accidentally kill more grizzlies around here than anything else. I would argue too that we are very close to the density at which people cease to thrive and at which we begin losing our daily connection to the natural world. But that is the subject of another talk and we will remain with the bears. For bears, for grizzly bears, these valleys, valleys like the Mission, valleys like the Flathead, um, 
like certain corners of, the, of Missoula's Valley. These valleys are key. In places like the Mission, bears can still move across and through the valley floor, surviving the crossing between mountain ranges where they have been missing for too long. It is a hard and dangerous crossing, but they manage it and they will manage it. You'll be surprised at where they end up. I know I have been surprised by bears around me. Anyone who has seen the data from their GPS collars will tell you that grizzlies own the Mission Valley at night. A subadult bear, for example, bedded in cottonwoods just beside our farmhouse. And without his co collar, we never would have known. The paths the bears will move on will be dangerous and vulnerable and bad decisions on our part can render them impassable. Subdivide the length of an essential creek, for instance, and fill the yards with barking dogs and bears will not travel that corridor anymore. Put more traffic on the highway, more unsecured trash on the porches, and too many grizzlies will die. It's a numbers game. If we want grizzlies to reoccupy more of their historic range, which I really, really do, we must make their lives easier and keep them from dying so often at our hands. We can do this in small ways by removing the temptations that get bears into trouble, like getting bear resistant trash bins, all the stuff I just showed to you, putting up electric fences around chicken coops. We also have to tackle the problem in larger ways by defending and preserving undeveloped land and by standing against subdivision and the fragmentation of important habitat. Never forget this, please. If we break a valley into small enough pieces, if we fill it too full of our own structures and our constructions and our animals, it will cease to sustain grizzlies and agriculture both. Then it will no longer be the thing that we love. Knowing this, we must use every tool, zoning, regulation, dialogue, easements, to ensure that one generation's whim or need does not seed another generation's ruin. Here is the heart of it. Seeing grizzlies thrive across a crowded West requires as much restraint as it does action. It means that we must, whether we are platting land for subdivision or traveling a highway at dusk, we must learn to slow down. And then we'll have to go further, finding a new gear reverse on a machine that we have been driving ahead at breakneck speed for nearly two centuries in this region. Breaking with one of the American West's fundamental traditions, we must be the first generation to leave this place less settled and to my way of thinking more whole than we found it. And if we can manage that, I see a bright future for us and for the bears. I see a future that includes not only reintroduction of bears to places where they've gone missing, but the natural process of grizzlies finding their way back to the places that were once home enacting a return that reminds me of the salmon I grew up with on the coast. The only difference here is that the bears are pursuing that return on a massive scale over generations through the backyards and creek bottoms and pastures of the place we call home. I think we owe it to them and ourselves to help them make the journey. Thank you. That's, that's what I've got. One, is it actually true that grizzly bears cannot climb trees? Because I've, I've read a lot of books about bears and I've heard kind of contradicting things. That's an excellent question. Um, they are not as good at climbing trees, but they are better than we are. They, um, I've, seen, I've seen grizzly bears up trees. Um, their cubs are particularly good at climbing trees um, and they use them readily. They're, I mean, grizzly bears are incredibly powerful and and they can climb, they can climb really well. Um, they just, their, their claws are not quite hooked the same way that a black bear's are. So a black bear can really do the full, you know, like the cat climb really well. A grizzly bear is just a little bit slower, but they're, they can, yes. Uh, with the uh, uh, animal conflict on ranches, mm -hmm. in your opinion, what's the safest and most cost-effective way to mitigate the conflict? So the question is, yeah, what's the safest and most cost-effective way to, yeah. to, to minimize conflict on ranches? Mm -hmm. Well, that, so that all depends on the ranch, the livestock, and the large carnivore involved. So like, if you brought that, I actually can't, I can't answer that question like with a single answer, but I can tell you that, you know, a lot of what 
a lot of what I see are issues with like wolves and cattle. That's a really common one. And so if you brought me that situation, I would say, okay, the way we do this is we bunch the herd more so that the animals are staying together. We get a couple of livestock guardian dogs out on the ground and we increase the human presence um, in terms of herders. And we start working with like the wildlife uh, management agencies to look into ways to, um, you know, figure out if you can get a collar or something in the pack so you can have a sense of how the wild and domestic animals are moving around and adjacent to each other in the landscape. Almost always the answer that I would give to that is not one tool, but a series of them. Um, but electrified barriers are very effective. Livestock guardian dogs are really effective. And so is herding. That would be my answer. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Hello, I'm Hello. Isaiah. Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, I just liked your comment earlier about the electric wire around the wolf, the, the fence to keep the wolves out and how that worked. And it just made me think about like how generational intelligence works in like animals like that. Cause I was raised in the middle of nowhere and we have chickens and we've had chickens our whole life. And for like 10 years, we never had coyotes ever attack the chickens. And then one time they got in, they found it. And after that, they started attacking all the time. And now we have ch like coyotes like outside our house, like every <laughs> week. Yeah. Patrolling. Yeah. So I just, it's interesting because like those coyotes that initially figured it out are probably dead at this point. And I right. just wonder if the wolves, like once they figure it out, you're screwed. Not quite a question. I just wanted to share. Yeah. That. I mean, it's a, I mean, at the risk of anthropomorphizing here, I mean, wolf packs, you know, bear families, all these animals that teach their young, they have something that's close to a culture. You know, there, there are certain, just like, you know, if, they, if anybody's ever heard about the different things that killer whales prey on, like there will be pods of killer whales that are all about seals. And that seals is like what they do, that's bread and butter. And like, there is another pod living in the same place that really, you know, is into salmon. And so like, they evolve these behaviors that work for them. And what you're describing when a, when a pack of coyotes comes in and they get chickens, that's a, that's a food conditioning. That's like an instance of food conditioning. And all animals are really susceptible to that. You know, that's why like, you know, that's why Pavlov's dogs salivate. That's why, um, you know, a bear who's been into trash once is really, really hard to keep on the landscape and safe. And that's why so much of this has to be proactive. And all of that goes back to like, what, when and how do you solve these issues? Because I would say that, you know, for those of you who have read Down from the Mountain, which is about bears getting into a cornfield, like once the bears have learned to eat that corn, you are just fighting an uphill battle all the way because instead of cruising the landscape, sort of like looking for the next way to survive, they are focused on one food source. And often with us, the, the food sources we create for them are so powerfully attractive that there's almost nothing that they could find in the natural, in like in, in native ecology and the natural landscape that would be as, as, as huge, as secure and as predictable. So it's food conditioning makes a big difference. And, they, and different groups of animals, they're individuals. That's, if, that's the thing I have learned most clearly from all of this is that we are selling them short if we don't think of them as individuals. Oh, yeah. Oh, is it, is it in the chat? Let's see. Let's see. So the comment about leaving the place, the Emily Cook one, is that what we're looking at? Yeah. Yeah. So Emily says, I loved your comment about leaving this place less settled than we found it. That really sticks with me. Is leaving this place less settled dependent upon not only reintroducing big predators, but also herbivores like bison. I mean, you know, short answer, yes. I mean, we, I think that, I think that there are, there are a lot of like low hanging fruit that we can pick at the beginning of this process. And some of that we're doing here, like Missoula County has an open space bond. 
And if folks are not sure what that is, like that's a, a tax that we voted for in this county. We raised, you know, I think it's $16 million um, in two different cycles. We've done this consistently over time to preserve open space. So like there, there are things like this that I think are fairly easy for us to do, even though like, I know an open space bond is not an easy thing in many counties, but it's a good beginning. Um, and so what we're doing right now is clearing, you know, picking some of these places that these animals really rely upon. But I think this work does have to continue. And I think that conversations like the one Emily raises about, you know, if we're gonna eat meat in this place, should it come from cattle or bison? I've, so I've dealt with both of those animals and I can tell you that that like everything else I've presented to you tonight is a complicated thing because bison can be easier on the landscape, but a lot of that now because, because we have broken the landscape up into so many parcels, all of that depends on management. So if you can do things like the American Prairie Reserve is working on uh, and you can create a landscape scale preserve, that's one thing. I think in, in places like Western Montana, where so much of the land has been built up and so many of our agricultural parcels are smaller, our solutions have to reflect that reality. Um, the bison question is a really interesting one um, because they are both, they're both wonderful animals, but also very hard to manage. Speaking as somebody who has sorted them and nearly been trampled by them, um, there are both uh, good and bad things about them, yeah. Yeah, this is kind of going off of the solutions that you were just talking about briefly. I just wanted to read a little bit of like my reflection to the reading and then a question that I had from it, if that's all right. Mm -hmm. um, I just thought that the beauty in Kittredge's piece was that it was in, you know, how he portrayed how agricultural communities are, are emotionally connected to and gener generationally fixated in the areas that they live and work. Um, and he, he made it evident that farmers and ranchers see themselves as a working part of the ecosystem um, as stewards of the land, um, in a sense. Um, and there was this one quote that stood out to me um, in saying that we were doing God's labor and creating a good place on earth, followed up with that's how our mythology defined it, although nobody would ever talk about it, work, talk about work in that way. Um, and I'm wondering if there is something that can be pointed to historically that caused this defensive attitude among agricultural communities. Um, you know, I just note that land use is a heavily disputed, heavily disputed topic among lawmakers and, uh, and agricultural or agriculture influences a lot of our state policies making. And I'm just wondering if it originated among homesteaders uh, and kind of how this mentality has influenced, influenced conservation policy in rural areas. That's an enormous question. It's the biggest question ever. Um, and and I, it's one that I think about all the time. I mean, th so this, I mean, there are these two kind of colliding ideas, right? There's an, uh, there's an ethos of stewardship, which you're describing, which is that if you talk, if you talk to almost any ranching family that, that I know or I've been around, they think of themselves as stewards of the land and they are, you know, that, but, you know, as Kittred says in that piece, you know, for, you know, agriculture is an art. It's just that there's good art and there's bad art. And, and that is, I think that's kind of what we're realizing right now is that we, we've come a long way on this idea, these two colliding ideas of dominion and stewardship, right? The dominion on the one hand, you know, the idea that we <laughs> have a right to do all this stuff and stewardship being, you know, we, we will cultivate and take care and in turn the land will take care of us. Well, what we're, I think what we're realizing, what many people are realizing is that throughout the last couple of centuries out here, you, there's been this almost entire ignoring, almost purposeful, well, very, entirely purposeful blindness to some of the things that the indigenous people understood very well. Things about reciprocity with the natural world, about the idea of, you know, how, how much can actually be extracted or taken without beginning to break the circle. And I think one of the things that you start to see now, that's one of the most heartening things I see among the agricultural community is beginning to think a little bit like that. And that doesn't always look like talking the way I talk up here. It could, it could mean starting to think about the carbon cycle in soil and starting to think about the way you manage animals having an effect 
on the native ecology of a grassland. It could mean, you know, it could mean something as simple and basic and like entry level as like ceasing to poison coyotes at, at an insane rate on your place. Because you realize that, you know, if you, you know, that that, that didn't work and that if you have a, a, a pack of coyotes that, you know, we, you were discussing different packs behaving in different, di different ways. And one of the things people are starting to understand is that like, if we become more thoughtful about this, if we begin to look at this relationship, not as something we impose, not as like a blank canvas that we paint things on, but as something as a reciprocal and continuously created, created state that human beings in the natural world are constantly creating together, that opens up a lot of possibilities we didn't have before. So that's, that's a ramble for a ramble, basically, is what, <laughs> what we've given each other. Um, but yeah, any, any other? Can you hear us from Zoom? Yeah, I can, yes. Awesome, I'd like to get one in. Thank you very much for your uh, work and your passion. Um, I'm gonna tap your expertise on the grizzly front a little bit. What do you, uh, what do you think on the Endangered Species Act um, talk going on with the grizzly? And is there an answer to get these isolated pockets of grizzlies more to intermingle? Is there, what are the hindrances of that? And, and is there an answer to that? What do you think? Yeah, okay, so I'm, here's a caveat. I, I will answer that question about what I think about endangered species, grizzly bears endangered species designation, but I will not answer it as the field director of a nonprofit because our work depends on being able to be involved in a couple different communities. Personally, what I think is that if you look at the trajectory of the landscape, if you look at the rising mortality in grizzlies, that I don't feel like we're at a position, we're at the place where I don't think it's the time to delist them. I think that time will occur if we behave, if we continue to do the right things. But I think given the speed at which this landscape is changing, you know, I mean, there, I passed six new homes between our farm and the highway like shells of houses going up right now. So we, right now, this is this crucial time. Um, so I, I, to answer directly, I would say that, you know, I feel like more work remains to be done before we should delist that animal. To your second point about connectivity and ways in which we can get animals moving from the places where we, where they are to where we want to see them. Um, that is happening right now. And all this work that I've been jabbering about today that is what lets this happen. And you know, add to that all the good work of like the Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes and their management, um, add to it the, the work of land trusts who are putting easements on properties so that they don't get built up. That's happening and, and we need to basically do what we can to make those animals survive. Of course you can transplant animals, but that as we saw with the reintroduction of wolves um, to Yellowstone, comes with a very complicated set of um, societal consequences. So to my way of thinking, I like it best when they get there themselves, we need to keep the roads open for them. Um, and last year, I think there were two bears that made the crossing from the NCDE across Interstate 90. And some of that stuff comes down to like these tiny essential spaces. So the nonprofit Vital Ground, the land, as a land trust, they bought, um, they bought five acres, which happens to be right where I-90 goes over the Clark Fork River. So there's like this, they own the land un, basically under I-90 there. And they're, they're making it into, you know, a vegetated thicket that's a great place for bears to cross. So there's some of these choke points that are super, super important. Um, like play, and Interstate 90 plays a huge role in it because there's just enough traffic on there that it's a hard thing for those bears to cross. So getting some of those important like pinpoint spots, right, is really important. Um, I want to just say one more thing about this, which is that, you know, we have a great bear biologist in Missoula, James Jonkel, Jamie. Um, and Jamie is this like incredibly wonderful, gruff, like guy. His father, Chuck Jonkel, was one of the pioneers of, of grizzly biology in Montana. So like, they're like a bear family. But Jamie was talking to me and he said, he said, you know, he's like, I grew up here. And he said, in 50 years, you will not recognize this valley. And he's, and this is, his view was kind of bleak. He said, you know, we're just like a big fucking glacier. 
He's like, we, we're, we take all the low country and we leave these mountaintops for the bears and we expect them to, to be able to survive with that. And I think that the task for us, the task ahead is to figure out how to depart from that oversimplified understanding of what parts of the landscape the bears need. Because as climate change and the influx of more people changes this landscape, those bears are going to be ever more in need of that low country and the ability to cross between these places. Yeah, uh, I'm Luke. And you have this great concept of leaving the land less settled than it was a generation ago. But as you just touched on, like water is going to be the new oil in our lifetime. And that means Montana is going to be the Saudi Arabia of America in our lifetime. And, you know, I know the very short term, five, 10 year projections, the Missoula and I assume, although I don't know for a fa fact, Montana population is going to explode. And that trajectory, especially once climate uh, migration starts kicking off, is probably going to just become exponential. Uh, do you think there is a, a pathway to achieving that goal realistically with, with yeah. those things coming towards us? Yeah, that, okay, that's a, that's a hard question. Um, because frankly, those things scare me, you know? But, but I also, and I, I, look at, <laughs> I look at the human track record and I don't see a lot of restraint, right? At the, either the individual or cultural level. But I think if you look at like, what are our choices, right? Like, uh, I mean, from a pragmatic, practical perspective, you know, I'm either gonna roll over and let this thing happen or I'm gonna fight like, like crazy against it. And that's always gonna be the one I would side with. I will say this though, that like, we're coming to, we're coming to, if we're not already there, a point of incredible inflection here, right? I mean, the, the, we, are at, we are at the diverging of the ways because you can look out, I mean, you can look down the Bitterroot and you can see some stuff in terms of what happens when a landscape like this, when we don't exercise um, collective restraint in the form of zoning and legislation, lo local ordinances that keep people from doing your, irresponsible things. Like we, a lot of that has happened here already. And there, enough of it has happened that probably some surprising people have been surprised, scared and disappointed by it. And I think there's actually some, some hope in that, that there might be communities and convergences that would allow for the protection of land that we wouldn't expect to be protected. I, I, like to your point about water, I mean, those are big forces that will come and they will shake things up. But there are also some big forces here, like the Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes are a sovereign nation with rights. You know, the, you know, the state of Montana, as the demographics change here, as, as, the, as the will of voters changes here, it's, it's like, to me, these things kind of run neck and neck and you just, you just hope to hell that <laughs> the right horse edges out. I mean, if you ask me what I think will happen versus what I hope will happen, those are two different things. But we have a chance, I mean, we have a chance here that, that a lot of other places don't have, right? Because a lot, of, a lot of people are looking at that point of inflection in the rear view mirror and we're seeing it coming toward us. And so that has gotta be worth something. That would be my answer. Uh, hi, my name is Hannah. This is not really related to that. Um, I was just thinking about like the agriculture versus like the predator um, scenario. And I was curious if you'd ever thought of like agricultural systems where the predators can kind of like work within it instead of having to like block them off, you know, like more food forest type thing. Um, and then alongside that, I was just kind of curious if you had any idea of what like indigenous cultures used to do. Um, because they obviously weren't putting up electric fences or anything like that and how they um, worked with the wildlife and the food system. Sure, yeah. So to your first, your first question is kind of about like how permeable are these systems? Like can the, ant, can, the, can the predators move through and make their living there? I think our farm is a really good example of that. So like I told you, Jillian and I, we have 
a, a farm where we raise mother cows and we raise grass-fed beef to sell in Missoula and then we're gonna have this berry patch. So for the berry patch, which is the thing that would draw the bears like crazy, that we set aside one acre or two acres out of 150 acres, which is what the farm is, two acres that we fence in and keep bears out of. We took another two acres, which is surrounding the spring that runs down through part of the place, and we started reforesting that with native vegetation. So we're taking some and we're trying to return some. And our farm, I hope, will always be an example of a place where at the same time as we make it more agriculturally productive by diversifying what we're doing there, growing more species, you know, growing you know, <laughs> all sorts of species in relation to each other, as in a food forest, at the same time, we're going to be making it better and not worse for a whole lot of native species, not just carnivores. Um, then your second question was about native peoples and ways in which they coexisted with large carnivores without some of the modern um, conveniences like electric fence. And what I, I mean, the short answer has to do with those slides that I was talking about, how different ways of humans making a living from the land change their position with regard to big carnivores. So if you're a hunting and gathering society, it may bother you occasionally to have wolves come in and run off a herd that you're hunting, but you're moving through the landscape and you're not saying like, this is my herd, anything messes with this herd is gonna answer to me, you know? So there's a, so I think that a lot of these issues, um, if you're talking about competition for food, they were just less of a problem in, in that time, if you're talking about things like bears coming into camp and getting into carcasses and stuff like that, I'm sure that happened too. And I'm sure that people used every tool at their disposal to avoid that conflict. So they probably hung things. Um, there, prob there probably were messy conflicts between individual communities and bears that became habituated to coming in and, and raiding camps. Um, so yeah, I, and I, I think there's probably, that's a really interesting question and you should talk to like, talk to the Salish Kootenai Cultural Committee and see if there are any people who have memories about that. Because there could be some people who have some thoughts. Um, hi, I'm Kennedy for the people on Zoom. But I was just first gonna say, I've been backpacking in the Bob Marshall complex and I've seen the, those bear hangs that you were showing on the screen. But my question was, as people who don't like live in, on a farm or like raise any animals, how can we help this relationship um, yeah. to coexist with predators? Okay, I'm glad you asked that. Um, so, and, and I would say about the Bob Marshall, those bear hangs, we have, the Bob Marshall needs to have a food storage ordinance and it doesn't have one right now. So a lot of those are just sort of like, kind of half-assed like low hangs and don't judge the ones we put in by those because we make better, sturdier ones that actually get the animal like more than four feet off the ground. Um, you were asking like, what can people do if they're, they're not right there on the front line of wilderness in, in the domesticated world? Um, a lot. So, I mean, you can exert, you can exert pressure uh, in terms of like pressure on, on your gover governance to look at some of these land issues. So you can support things like county bonds that protect open space. Um, you, can, you, can, you can, when you recreate in the back country, like you were describing, um, you can approach that with a mindset of being aware of large carnivores, you know, thinking about the time of year, thinking about where they are. Um, and actually like the weird thing is if you're living here in Missoula, like you are living in bear country, like the rattlesnake we're, we're doing a project of the rattlesnake right now. So like this is, you know, the edges of this community are where all that stuff gets done. You could be part of a community gleaning program. Um, there's a really cool apple gleaning program in Missoula. That's, um, so a bunch of people go out, pick apples, take them to Western Cider. They press a cider that's called the Great Bear. Um, so there are a lot of little ways like that, but really like, I mean, the people you put in charge in terms of who you vote for, that matters. Um, the ability to whatever extent you can to like volunteer or support nonprofits who are doing this work. And then also to demand in terms of how you eat. Um, like you get to choose by who you buy food from, you get to choose who you're supporting in terms of practices on the land. So insofar as you can, 
find out how people are looking at these issues and sharing the landscape with large carnivores and make that a part of your decision when you buy local food. Um, those would be my pieces of advice anyway. Bryce, I wanted to draw attention to, I put a quote in the chat box from Abigail, who's sitting over to my right here. Um, but one of the themes that's come up in several of our talks so far has been the power of myth and myth um, both as a false narrative, but also myth as a powerful guiding narrative, things that are here. And I'm wondering if you could read Abigail's question there about the myth making that Bill Kittredge talks about in there. And then what will it take for us to move to a different story, a different narrative of living in the land to do the kinds of things you're talking about? Yeah, so I'll, I'll, read, the, I'll read the question. Um, this is from Abigail. To what extent does the myth of land ownership in the American West discussed by William Kittredge continue to affect our relationship with the natural world? What specific steps can be taken to reshape this myth? Well, um, I mean, that's, that's a question that, I'm, I mean, every one of us is qualified to answer that question in a way. And, and here would be my answer to it. So the first part of it is, you know, to what extent does it continue to affect our treatment of land entirely? I mean, that, you know, I, I grew up internalizing that myth. That's why I came out here to be a damn cowboy, you know? I mean, that's like, it is very much still with us and it is very much still shaping the way we look at, you know, our day-to-day -day actions, both in terms of individual action and policy with the landscape. I think the more interesting part of, so it's, yeah, so yes. Um, what specific steps can we take to reshape this myth? Um, there's practical stuff, like what I was talking about in the first half of this talk. There's all these different practices that we can do that begin to make us think more about these animals and begin to foreground the fact that we do share the landscape with them and that they, they are resilient enough to still be here. But I also think we have to start changing the stories that we tell ourselves about this. And that's something that I've thought a lot about because this is what I write about. You know, this is what, I think about this all the time. And if, if I could accomplish one thing in the course of doing all of this writing, it would be to begin to change some part of the way people look at the natural world out here and look at animals and look at their role um, in terms of participating in that. So I think we need to change the stories. <laughs> we need to change the stories, change some laws, and probably change the way we eat. Those things are really important because you can, you can influence an individual rancher or farmer, right? Like somebody like, like me or like Oxbow Cattle Company or like the Mannixes, people who sell like local grass-fed beef. If people in Missoula come, like, okay, if you, let's say, let's say I was not as carnivore friendly as I am and I was selling beef in Missoula, if 10 people came up to me, this is like the Arlo Guthrie Alice's restaurant, and if two people came up to me, Nobody knows what I'm talking about. Um, but if, if 10 people came up to me in the course of being at a farmer's market and they asked me a question like, when you have wolf conflict, what do you do about it? And if I didn't have a good answer, if my answer was actually like, I call wildlife services and they shoot a few wolves. And if I said that and they gave me a look like, that is not what I hope to hear, I would start thinking seriously about that because that's my market. That's like, that's my living is being able to get that meat to people. You cannot do that through Cisco. You cannot do that through IBP, these huge you know, beef producers. So you can choose um, by how you eat and how you relate to the people who grow your food. Um, you can choose whether or not you're gonna to get to affect this. Now, there's a big, I mean, this is really, it's, this is a tough nut to crack, right? Because if you think about the pounds of beef that run through the town of Missoula, a town which by any measure is surrounded by cattle producing country. But it's, I don't know what the percentage is, but it's, there's a vanishingly small sliver of the pie that is local meat. And there's a giant lunking chunk of it that is produced by corporations. So we need to change that balance. Um, and so anyway, that's one of the practical things. But I also think this, this issue of storytelling, how do we talk about the land? How do we talk about the people who were who were pioneers and settlers here. How do we look at their, how do we look with a clear eye at their legacy and apply it to some of the land management decisions that we're doing today? Because there's, I believe, I, I believe that if you, we think about it enough, we can draw a straight line 
from what's happening out on Reserve Street to some of the mindsets that, that people had when they came into the country and started plunking down rectilinear boxes and, and <laughs> grids and creating that map of ownership. So it takes nothing less than like basically a full-scale revolution about how we think about land and our place in it. So we, we have our work cut out for us, I think is what I'm saying. So Bryce, unfortunately, we've reached the end of our time here and uh, really want to thank you so much for coming and sharing with us uh, the things you've given us a lot to think about. Students will be writing response papers and stuff on that here. Um, Bryce may be able to stick around for a few minutes afterwards if people have individual questions on them there, but let's go give Bryce one more round of applause here. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank, thank you for having me. Appreciate it.